Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-kareem. We begin in the name of the one God. The God who created the Christian, the God who created the Jew, the God who created the Hindu and the Buddhist, the same God who created the Muslim. The same God who sent the Torah to Moses, the Gospel to Jesus, and the Quran to Muhammad. The same God who sent to all the prophets of Allah the guidance for mankind. The same God who created the gold coin and the silver coin as money. And we thank that to uh, Weera Lewis Owen of Public Gold for his kind invitation to speak to you today on the gold dinar and silver dirham unveiling the end time. And we want to begin by sharing with you some of the information we have about the end time. Our prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, prophesied that there will be slavery in the end time. It was close to the end of his life and he was sitting in the masjid with his companions when a stranger entered the masjid. And no one knew who this man was. And he walked through the gathering without anyone stopping him. And he came and he sat directly in front of the prophet Allah's blessings be upon him. And this was a breach of security. Why did someone not stop him? And he began to question the prophet. And we know that good manners is that you only ask a question when you don't know the answer. <laughs> But he's asking questions, and when the prophet would answer, he'd say, your answer is correct. So he's some kind of a school principal. <laughs> Among the questions that he asked, well, what are the signs of the last day? Which is our topic, unveiling the end time. And among the answers given by the Prophet, Allah's blessing be upon him, is the following. That a slave woman, a slave woman would give birth to her mistress. indicating that in the end time that there would be slavery. Oh, but slavery is abolished. There is no legal slavery anywhere in the world today. And there is no likelihood that the legal ban on slavery will be removed. So legally, there is no slavery left in the world. Well, then how will there be slavery in the end time? Answer, although you are not legally a slave, you are actually a slave. Economic slavery monetary slavery, 
and other forms of slavery. Yes, that time has arrived. And there are large numbers of people around the world today who are effectively enslaved. Although the newspapers and television and the universities and most of all the governments will never say that this is slavery. But here in public gold, we can say it's slavery. How can a slave woman give birth to her mistress? It is not just the economic impoverishment, the descent into destitution, and economic enslavement, so that someone from Pakistan would have to leave Lahore and come to Temerlo and work in a farm. Or worse than that, and I make no apologies to anyone, that a woman from Indonesia who is my daughter will have to leave Indonesia and go to the glittering gold state of Singapore to work for a slave wage to the eternal disgrace of Singapore because no Singaporean woman will work for that wage. That is the slavery we now have. And it is a slave woman, not a slave man, who will give birth to her mistress. Because in the end time, there is someone who wants to turn upside down the system created by the Lord God. And that system of life created by the Lord God is one in which there is a male and a female. Uh, excuse me, I think it's only two, is it? Is it only two? Not three? Huh? Not three, only two. Thank you for confirming. <laughs> a male and a female. And the two are like the day and the night. So you have to have a PhD in stupidity to put an equal sign between them. Because they're not equal, they are complementary. But that's too difficult for some people to understand when they're totally brainwashed. When you are 84 years of age, as I am, by the moon, not by the sun, you can speak with thunder, with pepper. I used to be a young man once upon a time, and I spoke more softly. But I've seen the world unveiled before my eyes. And now in my old age, I speak with thunder. So the, the male and the female have been created to complement each other. And because this is only one of the two who can procreate, who can bring a baby into the world. I believe also in Malaysia, it's only the woman who can give birth to a baby. <laughs> I want to make you smile a little bit <laughs> because it's bitter medicine tonight, bitter medicine tonight. So the male and the female are created differently. If you do not stay at home and take care of your children when they are babies, they're helpless. They need mama. They don't need a part-time mother. They need a full-time mother. Because bringing up children is a full-time job. So the Lord God has said, when a man dies and he leaves an inheritance, 
the son gets twice the share of the daughter. For those who have nothing in their head except peanuts, they say that's discrimination against women because they only have peanuts in their head. They're incapable of thinking. The son gets two shares and the daughter gets one because the son, the men have a duty to maintain women. That's right. And if a man cannot maintain his wife, she has the right to seek a divorce. But then a wicked man comes along and says, no. A woman could do anything that a man does. And he tries to overturn the system of nature. And so now you have children growing up as bandits and as criminals, sunk in promiscuity. And society is collapsing because you have part-time mothers now. And this is a sign of progress. Oh, yes, this is progress when a woman can become the prime minister. This is progress. And you must have so many women in the cabinet. That is called progress. And so, eventually, men will stay home and take care of the children. <laughs> and women will go out and take care of the affairs of the world. And they call that progress. But when women delay marriage, eventually they can't have a baby. Nietzsche has his own laws, but she needs a baby. So that slave woman, enslaved because of the bogus monetary system and the oppressive banking system, that slave woman sunk in slavery. Her womb now becomes a factory and she's paid for her services. But when the baby is born, the baby parts from mama. The baby goes first class. <laughs> While mama remains a slave. And that is the fulfillment of the prophecy that a slave woman will give birth to her mistress. But there's more to the end time as we unveil the end time. Our prophet prophesied as only a true prophet could prophesy that in the end time one man one man would have to maintain 50 women you may or may not have heard of that prophecy Because, you know, in this age, there are more important things to do, like eating durian. That one man would have to maintain 50 women. And perhaps one of the reasons for that would be that uh, only baby girls are being born. And there's a scarcity of baby boys. Something is happening to the sperm. Perhaps one of the reasons for that is that men will increasingly become turned away from women because of the adversarial relationship produced by the modern feminist revolution. And men stop maintaining women. Or he might marry her. But she has to go to work while he goes to the casino. <laughs> or he goes to the pub. 
And she got to work and bring the income. I've seen it with my own eyes in France. I've seen it with my own eyes. And so men abandon their responsibility for maintaining women because they're turned off by the adversarial relationship between the male and the female produced by the modern feminist revolution. Whatever be the reason, this is what he prophesied, that one man would have to maintain 50 women. But uh, maintenance of a woman involves more than simply providing food and clothing and shelter. A woman needs more than that, particularly if she's a young woman. If she does not have a means of satisfying her biological needs, she can either go crazy or she can go into sin. She can either go crazy or she can go down the road of sin. So tell me, with your PhD from some university, how are you going to solve that problem if this man is truly a prophet of God? And if this prophecy is to come to pass, that one man would have to maintain 50 women. In the Quran, which is the word of the one God, of course, universities will dispute that. Absolute truth is in the university, not in the Quran. In the Quran, Allah has said that a man can marry up to four, four wives. But if you fear that you cannot be just to them, then stay with only one. But how are you going to solve the problem of 50 women being maintained by one man? And these are women who do not want to go into the garbage bin. They want to live lives of purity and chastity. and be virtuous one. But in the Quran, Allah speaks not only of a contract of nikah or a marriage certificate with a wife, but he also speaks of a second kind of relationship called milk al yamin who is a wife, but not a wife of nikah, of marriage. And if she is a wife of Milkal Yameen, there are some 15 verses of the Quran on the subject. That's a lot of verses. I was in Indonesia many years ago, staying at the home of one of my students. When she asked me, and that Indonesian student is present tonight, today in this gathering, she asked me, Sheikh, if a milk al Yamin is a slave woman, and if slavery is now abolished, there is no more slavery in the world, does that mean that these 15 verses of the Quran are now obsolete, like your old laptop computer, obsolete. <laughs> that verses of the Quran can become redundant, that they now go into cold storage, they can no longer be applied. Is that possible? And I answered to her because I had not studied the subject. I said, no, 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 not possible. The Quran is absolute truth. That's what it says about itself. Absolute truth. And absolute truth is eternal. It cannot be ever become obsolete 
and redundant. So there must be a way in which we can still apply medically, I mean. But there is no more slavery in the world. So how can a woman become medically a mean? She, she cannot find a husband. No, and, and she's growing older. No one is willing to marry her, none. And she does not have the means to maintain herself. She has to walk on the road to look for a job. And when she walks on the road to look for a job, the shark bite even more fiercely at this helpless woman. What is she to do? So when I researched this subject, I realized that legally slavery has ended. But factually, slavery still exists. Let me repeat it for the scholars of Islam who refuse to think. They only eat their roti chanai and drink their te tarik and go to sleep. My language is harsh, and I make no apologies for it. For those who refuse to think, she may be Legally, she is not a slave, but factually, she is a slave. And since there is factual slavery today, it is possible for us to apply these voices of the Quran on Miracle Yameen. And so there is a way out for these women who cannot find a husband who do not want to live lives of sin. You know, a woman in the dark, it's only a rat. It's only a rat who will want a woman in the dark, not a man. A man will bring her into the sunshine. A rat will keep her in the dark. So these are not women who want to be kept in the dark. They want to walk the road with dignity. They want to be respected by society. So this is a means through which you can, we can resolve this problem of one man having to main 50, maintain 50 women. Through, ma through the marriage contract, which is called nikah, and in addition to the contract of nikah, there is medical yameen. But I am a solitary voice at this time. No one else is prepared to come forward to speak on this subject. Oppression will come in the, in the end time, unveiling the end time. Oppression will come to such an extent, said our prophet, and that Oppression is there now in Gaza. That a man will pass by a grave and he'll roll on the grave. And he say, I wish I were inside this grave rather than a dead man. Not for religious reason, but because of biting oppression. You don't know about that in the comfort zone called Malaysia. But go across to Indonesia to see it. <laughs> Biting oppression in the end time. And nowhere do you find that oppression greater than in the Holy Land, in Gaza, as genocide stalks the land. But our prophet prophesied as only a true prophet of the Lord God could prophesy, Singapore, I hope you're listening, that a Muslim army will march to Jerusalem and that army will be unstoppable. Singapore, I hope you're listening because of the 
foolish alliance of Singapore with Israel, an alliance you will live to regret. That that Muslim army will march to Jerusalem and it will be unstoppable. This is what a man named Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, said. And that army will liberate the Holy Land. In the end time, for we are unveiling the end time, the Messiah will return. Who is the Messiah? The Christian knows that the Messiah was the son of the Virgin Mary, Maryam. The Christian knows what the Muslim also knows, that the Messiah is the son of the Virgin Maryam. The Christian and the Muslim both know that the Messiah came. The Christian and the Muslim both know that the Messiah left. The Christian and the Muslim both know that the Messiah will one day return. But there are two kinds of Christians. Public role, I'm sure you know that. <laughs> there are those Christians who follow Jesus. And amongst those Christians, a man can never marry another man, get a marriage certificate. Not those Christians. And the other Christians who follow a fellow called Santa Claus. And in the end time, it is this community which follows Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, and this community which truly follows Jesus and you don't find them in Washington. No. <laughs> and you don't find them in London and in Paris and in Bonn and in Madrid and in Rome. No. You don't find them in Western Christianity, which is provoking nuclear war on Russia as, as we speak. The president of Serbia, who knows more than I know, is anticipating nuclear war within the next few months. The president of Serbia, who knows more than I know, is anticipating nuclear war within the next few months. They're waging war on Russia. And they want nuclear war. But these two people who believe that the Messiah will come, will return, they know that the Lord God will intervene in that great war. Yes, there's a surah of the Quran called Surah to Rahman. It's a very strange surah of the Quran. The Lord God does not waste words. So when he repeats one verse 31 times, he's speaking to an alliance of two people, these sinful human beings and these sinful jinn who are in alliance with each other. And he says, I'm going to deal with both of you who are laden with sins. This surah of the Quran tells us something about that great war, that nuclear war which is coming. That the Lord God will intervene. Washington, you got a surprise coming for you <laughs> because you rejected the Quran. Yes. You said you don't believe that the Quran is the word of God. But there are Christians, the Quran says, the Quran says that there are Christians, some Jews maybe, but mostly Christians, 
The Quran has prophesied that they will believe that this Quran is the word of God and yet remain Christians. The Quran prophesies in Surah to Ali Imran that there will be Christians, mostly Christians, but maybe some Jews, who will believe that this Quran is the word of the one God, but still remain Christians. Shall I repeat it a third time? <laughs> and when they do that, this alliance will take place in the end time. At this time, it is only an alliance between Russia and China. I'm not talking about that China, which is a puppy dog of Washington. I'm not talking about that China, which is a puppy dog of Washington. I'm talking about that China, which is an alliance with Russia. That alliance is coming to being, and it is the most powerful alliance since the emergence of modern Western civilization. But there's a second alliance coming between those who follow Jesus and those who follow Muhammad. Those who have their Qibla in, Wash in, in Mecca, not in Washington. They don't sit on the fence playing golf with the enemy. <laughs> no, they are faithful to absolute truth in the Quran. Those Muslims in alliance with those Christians. And this will take place in anticipation of the return of the Messiah who will then rule the world from Jerusalem. And when he comes back, there'll be no more US dollar, and no more U Euro, and no more Malaysian ringgit. Tell that to the governor of the Central Bank of Malaysia. <laughs> There will be gold dinar and silver dirham that will return as money in the end time. This is a taste. <laughs> this is a taste of what it is to unveil the end time. But where are we now? What do we have today as money? I have been teaching this subject for more than 25 years. I lived in Malaysia for five years and I lectured extensively and yet I failed to change the views of a single prominent scholar of Islam. None. They reject my views. But on Judgment Day they'll have to answer. What is money in the Quran? What is money in the life of the Prophet? Allah's blessing be upon him. I just want to give you a taste of the subject because we don't have time to do more than that. But I have this book, The Gold Dinar and Silver Dirham, Islam and the Future of Money. I need to write a new chapter in this on the petrodollar. I don't have the time to do it. We have this book, The Prohibition of Riba in the Quran and Sunnah. And we have this book, The Importance of the Prohibition of Riba in Islam. And all these three books we also have in Bahasa. A companion of the Prophet, now listen carefully. A companion of the Prophet, والسلام, whose name was Bilal, radiallahu ta'ala. He came and he offered some dates to the Prophet. I'm going to speak slowly so you have no excuse for not understanding. The Prophet looked at the dates and he said, Bilal, these are high quality dates. Where did you get them? Bilal said, O Messenger of Allah, 
I had two kilograms. Let me use modern weight measures. Two kilograms of inferior quality dates. And I exchanged them for one kilogram of the superior quality dates. Maybe the value of the inferior quality dates was 10 ringgits a kilo. So the two kilograms would be worth 20 ringgits. And the value of the superior quality was 20 ringgits. So it was a fair exchange. Bilal, said the prophet, this is the essence of riba. Riba is a transaction in which you rip off people of their wealth. That is riba. It's drinking the blood of people. That's riba. And the prophet said about the one who consumes riba, it's like snakes in his belly. He said, if you consume even one dirham of riba, it's equivalent to committing zina 35 times. Adultery, fornication, not zina. And our prophet cursed all four. He cursed them. And he said they're all equally guilty, the one who takes riba. He put his money in a fixed deposit in the bank and he's using the interest. He takes riba. Or he lent his money on interest. And he's consuming the interest. He cursed him. He cursed the one who gives the riba. He borrowed the money and he's paying the interest. He cursed him. He cursed the one who records the transaction and he cursed the two witnesses and he said they're all equally guilty. So riba is terrible. The last revelation to come from the one God is the Quran. The last revelation to come down in the Quran is on riba. And in that revelation, the Lord God said, me and my prophet, we're going to wage war against those who practice riba. So the prophet said, Bilal, this exchange of two kilograms of dates, inferior quality, for one kilogram of dates, superior quality, this is the essence of riba. Why is it riba when it's a fair exchange? This one is worth 20 ringgits, that one is worth 20 ringgits. Why is it riba? I have been teaching this subject now for more than 25 years. <laughs> and you still find lots of people who cannot answer the question, why is it riba? The answer is to be found in another very famous statement of our prophet. Allah's blessing be upon him. And this is where we understand when Jesus, Nabi Isa Islam, went into the temple and he found the money changers in the temple doing something and he cursed them and he turned over their tables and he chased them out of the temple, Masjid Al-Aqsa. And he said, you have taken the house of God and transformed it into a den of thieves. This is Jesus, the lion. But Christmas time, you only hear about the lamb. <laughs> you don't hear about the lion, not in Manhattan at all. 
This is what our prophet said, which helps you to explain, understand why Jesus acted the way he did. He said, when a transaction involves an exchange of gold for gold, which is what they were doing in the temple. The, the Roman government was minting gold coins with a graven image on the coin, and this was prohibited haram. So the temple minted its own coins. <laughs> And people coming to the temple, the Israelite people, will have to change their Roman money for temple money. So it was an exchange of gold for gold. Okay. So a prophet said, when an exchange involves, when a transaction involves an exchange of gold for gold, or silver for silver, or wheat for wheat, or barley for barley, or dates for dates, or salt for salt. We can add uh, rice for rice, not the uh, cooked rice, not the 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 the, the, the one with the with the uh, paddy paddy rice. What is paddy rice? In, in Bahasa. Baras. 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 Paddy rice. Baras. We could also add sugar. <laughs> huh? So gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, salt. And we added sugar and baras rice. We could add other things as well. He says, once it is a transaction involving like, for like, it must be equal for equal, and it must be hand to hand, meaning a cash transaction, not a credit transaction. Other than that, he said, it would be riba. Now then. What is there which is common to all six? Gold, silver, wheat, barley, dates, and salt. You are lucky that I don't have the time to question you. <laughs> You're lucky. So I have to tell you the answer. What is common to all six is that they were all used as money. Money has three functions. Money is used as a medium of exchange for buying and selling. Barter is not always possible. It's more convenient to use money. Money is used as a measure of value. How much should you pay for the book? How much should I pay for a haircut? And I understand that durian is now being sold for six ringgits in some places. Eh? My wife is very happy with that. And money is used as a store of value. These are the three functions of money. So if we were with the young men who stood up against the godless world and proclaimed the truth, only the young will do that today. And then they had to flee. Anyone who stands up for the truth, you're going up to jail. You, they put you in jail. And they fled. And they they stopped at a cave to take some rest. And Allah put them to sleep for 300 years. You know what I'm talking about. 
Huh? You know which surah of the Quran I'm talking about. But they had some money with them. And uh, after 300 years, Allah woke them up. And if you were sleeping for 300 years, when you woke up, you'd also be hungry. <laughs> so they said, go take, take this money, go buy some food. But the amazing thing is that after 300 years, they were confident the money can still buy the food. Because we never had something called inflation. the curse of inflation. And so money in the Quran could store value for 300 years. When I was five years of age, my father bought a car. He took me to the market. And at five years of age, I'd be holding a basket running with my father. I saw him buy a, a hundred oranges. In those days, there were no plastic bags. You had to use jute bags. And he bought a hundred oranges for one dollar. Seventy-five years later, in the same market, one dollar cannot buy even one orange. This is called inflation, but not the money that the young men had in the cave. So money has three functions. A, a, me, a medium of exchange, a measure of value, and a store of value. And money created by the Lord God was dinar and dirham, a gold coin and a silver coin. And public gold must be very happy to hear that. Oh, yeah, here we are. This is public gold, a five dinar piece. Five dinars, look at it, five dinars. And this is ten dinars, yeah, ten dinars. And this is ten dirhams, and this is five dirhams. Okay? One dinar. And one, one dinar here. Yeah. Half a dinar. Half a dinar, yeah. One third, one third of a dinar. Very good. If you want to buy Tay Tariq, yeah. <laughs> you need a small coin. <laughs> All right? It's almost in Kazakhstan. How much is this? Uh, only four. One quarter. One dinar. Okay, a quarter dinar. I'm not seeing the small dirhams, only the small dinar. Okay. So gold, dinar, and silver dirham were created by Allah as money. But the government, the governor of the central bank of Malaysia probably doesn't know that. So please, when you meet him, tell him that. Gold dinar and silver dirham were created by Allah as money. And when gold and silver were in short supply in the market in Medina, they would use dates as money. This is not barter, no. Dates were used as money that you will pay me in dates for this book, and I will take the dates and pay the barber for the haircut. So money, dates for you is as money. And this was because dates were in abundant supply in the market. And so the definition of money from the Quran and the Sunnah is that money is always gold and silver, regardless of whether we mint it or others mint it. It's money. 
A British gold coin is money. And when gold and silver are in short supply in the market, then you can use items of food consumption. Remember, food consumption, because they can ban you from keeping gold and silver. That's what the U.S. government did in 1931. This book, this book will tell you the history of that, the prohibition of riba in the Quran and Sunnah. The U.S. government banned all Americans from keeping gold. And those who had an understanding of what was happening, they took their gold and they shipped it to Switzerland. <laughs> But the rest of the Americans, like sheep and cattle, gave their gold to the U.S. government, and the U.S. government gave them the value of 20 U.S. dollars for one ounce of gold. After the U.S. government had collected all the gold in the United States, they changed the value of the gold. <laughs> Instead of $20 to one ounce, they made it 25. And now people could buy back their gold from the U.S. government. And so the U.S. government ripped off the American people of nearly half their gold. If you want to restore real money in the market, and there's a shortage of gold and silver, or something called the International Monetary Fund. I don't know if you've ever heard about it, which rules the world of money. And Dr. Mahathir was not aware of that just before he retired. And the International Monetary Fund, the Articles of Agreement of the IMF prohibit the use of gold as money. Why? Don't ask that question. Don't ask that question. That's not allowed. You have to prohibit the use of gold as money because the, the money which is replacing the gold, which is the US dollar and the sterling pound and the euro, and the Malaysian ringgit, and the Indonesian rupiah, and the Pakistani rupee, and the Bangladeshi taka, etc. This bogus and fraudulent and utterly haram money, which they're now going to use to rip off mankind and use it like a vacuum cleaner with which you clean your carpet, sucking the wealth of mankind from the masses to the West and sucking the wealth of the world to such an extent that most of the world will be sunk in such poverty while this side becomes heaven itself, that Trump will say, build a wall to keep them out. <laughs> because there are economic refugees now leaving Africa, leaving all the poor countries and inundating the Western world because these are places where the pasture is green. Their money is called hard. <laughs> Their money is called hard currency. And our money is worthless. <laughs> I was invited to a, a conference in Brunei. Those were the days when I had not been banned <laughs> from lecturing in Brunei. And there was a galaxy of eminent scholars of Islam in that conference. And they were getting one hour to lecture and Imran got 15 minutes. 
So in my 15 minutes, I had to give an explanation of the difference between hard currency that they have and we don't have. So I made a joke. And I tell you, when you make a joke and nobody laughs, it's terrible. Huh? You make a joke and nobody laughs. You feel terrible. And that's what happened. I said the reason why they have hard currency. Anytime you're traveling, you need US dollars. Or you need sterling pounds, or you need euros. You don't need ringgits. You don't want Pakistani rupees. Because you can go to Manhattan with a suitcase filled with Pakistani rupees. You can't even buy copio. <laughs> so the reason why they have hard currency and we don't have it is because they have a secret chemical. And they dip their money into the chemical and it becomes hard currency. <laughs> Nobody laughed. These eminent scholars of Islam sitting there and nobody laughed. Because they believed what I said. <laughs> this is the state that we are in today. That this Money which is going to replace the dinar and dirham is bogus. But if dinar and dirham enters the market, then the bogus money will collapse. That is why they had to put it in the Articles of Agreement of the International Monetary Fund that you are prohibited from using dinar and dirham as money. So how do we proceed now in unveiling the end times? This cannot be a lecture on Islam and the international monetary system. We don't have the time for that. They not only gave us paper money, they gave us only one currency, only one, which was redeemable in gold. The rest was floating, <laughs> and that was the U.S. dollar. And the U.S. dollar was redeemable as gold at $35 an ounce. This was 1944, and it continued until 1971. President Charles de Gaulle was different from our ulama because that man could think. Oh yes, our ulama have lost the capacity to think. And he realized that the US dollar was an instrument of oppression and injustice. And he stood up in the French National Assembly and he did what no alim, no Islamic scholar have done. And he blasted the monetary system as unjust. And he ordered the French National Bank to redeem U.S. dollars for gold. The IMF was not pleased at all with that. And so the Zionist lobby went to work and they removed Charles de Gaulle quickly. He retired when he lost the election. But the successor government continued his policy until in 1971, Richard Nixon realized that the French were now threatening the system by demanding gold for US dollars at $35 an ounce. This book explains that subject. So what he did was, he said, we gave our word, meaning 
that the U.S. dollars can be redeemed for gold at $35 an ounce, provided it's the central bank doing it. We gave our word. This is international law, but we do not have to keep our word. <laughs> so we are now unilaterally reneging on this international law. The U.S. government will no longer redeem U.S. dollars for gold. And from 1971 until 1973, the U.S. dollar was in a place called no man's land. And it began to fall in value until it reached $40 an ounce. And then came the war of 1973, in which the Zionists were on both sides. They were on the side of the Soviet Union and the side of the West. <laughs> And uh, King Faisal imposed an oil boycott on the United States, which they were expecting, Kissinger knew it. And the, the US dollar fell from $40 an ounce of gold to 160 The US dollar lost 400% of its value. The price of gold went up by 400%. And it was then that Kissinger, who just recently died, made the most famous move in all of diplomatic history. He went to Faisal, may Allah have mercy on Faisal, Rahimahullah, who at that time had nothing but peanuts in his head. And he said, let's make a deal. We will guarantee the security of the state of Saudi Arabia if you will also, on, on, your, on your behalf, if you will sell your oil for nothing else but U.S. dollars. And I promise you that the money you're now getting and you're so happy with it, this is peanuts to what you're going to get. And Faisal fell for it. <laughs> And so the petrodollar was born. That is not in this chapter of this book. I have to put in another chapter on the petrodollar. And that caused the US dollar to fly high as never before. And the wealth of the world kept on coming to the western side of the world. But all of this could have been prevented if our scholars had declared that this money is bogus it's fraudulent, it's haram, but none of them would do it. Today, the petrodollar is going, and cryptocurrency is taking over, and Bitcoin is taking over, and whatever and ever they have, in addition to that. But the Quran and the Sunnah informs us that in order for money to be valid money, it must have intrinsic value. In order for money to be valid money, it must have intrinsic value. The value of the money must be in the money, not in George Soros's pocket. You cannot manipulate the value of the money and go back home with a million ringgits for having done no work by playing the market in a scheme that is otherwise called gambling, speculative transactions with money. But because our scholars have be betrayed the Quran, this is where we are today. What do we do? What do we do? Answer we are now enslaved and Israel could commit genocide in Gaza and we can do nothing about it. Malaysia has hardly done what the American students have done. Students of universities in the United States have done more than Malaysia has done. 
They are demonstrating on university campuses all over the United States. Do you have that in Malaysia? Demonstrating against genocide in Gaza. Has it changed the Israeli government? No. The Israeli government is hell-bent on pursuing its policies, regardless of public opinion. The Secretary General of the United Nations Organization is warning, warning, warning. The Security Council adopts resolutions and Israel has said, go your way, we don't care for you. We're going to do whatever you want to do. We disregard the Security Council. So it looks as though Pax Judaica is coming. And Pax Americana is riding out into the sunset. Why are we so helpless? <laughs> Answer, because we are enslaved. Our governments no longer represent us. Our governments are all in the pockets of our enemies. But that's not true of Russia. And that's not true of China. And that's not true of Iran. And that's not true of Venezuela. And that's not true of Korea. And that was not true of Bolivia. But then they changed the Bolivian government. Whoever stands up to them have to be free. And the rest are all enslaved. So when our prophet said that in the end time, a Muslim army will march from Jerusalem, sorry, from Khorasan, and no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. How will that army march when we are not free, when we are enslaved? Khorasan is Iran, Afghanistan, the north of Pakistan, and the regions north of Afghanistan. That's Khorasan. But in this region, the most important actor is Pakistan, because Pakistan is a nuclear state. And then Afghanistan and Iran, these are the most important actors. Iran is free. Oh, yes. When Israel attacked the Iranian diplomatic consular mission in Damascus and killed a number of senior military officers, what did Iran do? Iran retaliated by sending some 300 missiles, some of them hypersonic missiles, to attack Israel. Only a free country could do that. Pakistan couldn't do that. The generals of the Pakistan Armed Forces were Yankee puppy dogs, could never do that. They must be wincing with my words, because nobody in Pakistan speaks this way. But I'm not in Pakistan. And I can tell the generals, you can kill a man, but you cannot kill the truth. So Iran is free. It was an Iranian leader who did that no Muslim leader could do. He pointed his finger at Washington and he said, you are Shaitan al-Akbar, the greatest Satan. Can your Malaysian prime minister do that? <laughs> Afghanistan is free because Afghanistan has the best woman in the world of Islam. It is the woman of Afghanistan who gave birth to sons and brought up those sons 
to fight and to defeat the United States. Take those same women out of Afghanistan and take them to Washington. Would they be able to do it? Give them the freedom of the modern Western feminist revolution. Can they bring up sons who can defeat the United States? So tell the feminist revolution, leave us alone, go your way. Afghanistan is free. I was lecturing in Islamabad in August of 2019. And while I was lecturing, the puppet government in Afghanistan fell and the president had to flee out of Afghanistan. And Afghanistan won her freedom. And Imran Khan, who was then the prime minister, spoke those memorable words. This is why he's now in jail. He said, Afghanistan has broken the shackles of slavery. So Iran is free and Afghanistan is free. But that army can march from Khorasan only when Pakistan is also free. So before we end, as we unveil the end time, how can Pakistan be free so that we can liberate Gaza and the suffering Palestinian Muslims and Christians can get relief? Answer, Pakistan can only win her freedom if you wage a struggle beginning with the struggle to bring back real money in the market, which is dinar and dirham. Our strategy is not to declare that the Pakistani rupee must be abolished and immediately replaced with dinar and dirham because that will create economic mayhem monetary mayhem. We say leave the rupee in the market, but make dinar and dirham legal tender, meaning that you're legally allowed to use dinar and dirham as money. So the question, where will we get the dinar and dirham and the answer is, you dumb dumb, that's not your responsibility, you dumb dumb. The market operates on the basis of demand and supply. And once there is a demand for dinar and dirham in the market, there will be endless businessmen who will come forward to ensure is an adequate supply. We have bankers sitting here in this gathering and they could understand what I'm talking about. So there'll be no problem with dinar and dirham. And once the dinar and dirham is, is brought into the market, eventually the rupee will eventually collapse on its own. And Pakistan will begin the process of restoring freedom. But there's the other part as well. Allah says, The transaction based on borrowing and lending on interest are not business transactions. No. That borrowing and lending money on interest does not qualify as a business transaction. When you allow money to be borrowed and lent on interest, you corrupt the market. The market will no longer be a free and a fair market and wealth will no longer circulate through the economy. 
A healthy economy is one in which wealth circulates through the economy. And so you'll never, you'll never find in a healthy economy that the rich remain permanently rich and the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty. The bankers in this gathering will understand what I'm talking about. That is the economy today because of riba, because of the banking system. Around the world today, the rich are now permanently rich and growing richer. And the poor are imprisoned in permanent poverty. Not in the comfort zone of Malaysia, but in other places. And growing into greater and greater poverty and destitution, which is why you have so much economic refugees all over the world. But Trump doesn't know that. So this is the road to freedom for Pakistan. And if the Pakistani people wage the struggle which they can make, like the Iranians had done it before, and Pakistan wins her freedom, then a Muslim army will march from Khorasan and liberate the Holy Land. And our people in Gaza will get freedom from oppression. Thank you. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Question. Okay, uh, kita buka uh, untuk uh, soal jawab. We open the floor for the question and answer. Thank you. Anyone can just stand up and and say out loud your question or share. Kita ada masa sedikit untuk soalan soal jawab. Any question? Okay, thank you. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. My name is Aziz Ali. Thank you for the enlightening points that you mentioned. I do have one question. After the Muslim army marches into uh, Jerusalem, takes over, what happens to the state of Israel, the Jews, and all that? Any, any idea? Of course, we can only speculate. What happens after that? <laughs> they, because reality, they are not just going to sit down and accept all this, you know, welcome us with open arms. Your question is taking us on a tangent away from my topic. <laughs> I have a book at the back entitled The Messiah, the Quran, and the End Time. I was in what I was in Moscow in February attending a very important conference multipolarity conference and after the conference was over I was surprised to be invited with a small group a little bit more than a dozen to have dinner with the Russian foreign minister Sergei Lavrov the minister arrived and he was comfortable. He took off his tie and he's joking and laughing and he spent two hours with us. In addition to my scholarship in Islamic studies and in philosophy, I also have expertise in international relations. And the minister was speaking on international politics, international economics, monetary economics. And for me, I was in heaven because I'm getting an insider information. <laughs> but when I took up the subject of the Quran and Russia, everything fell silent. No more smiles. <laughs> because the Russians still had the lingering fear of Islam in their hearts. And I had to struggle with the minister, struggle, struggle, struggle. He was surprised when I used the name Constantinople. He stopped me, he said, I'm happy you're using the name Constantinople. He was surprised to learn that the Black Sea is in the Quran. And at the end, he asked me, 
Can you prepare a document for me and what does the Quran say pertaining to Russia? And what does your prophet say? So I said, thank Allah, this is a good start. <laughs> but I then said to myself, this is a very busy man. He probably won't have time to read it. So let me write a book instead. The Quran and Russia's destiny. And that book is almost finished now. <laughs> and in that book, you'll get the answer to your question. That while it is a Muslim army, not a Christian army, which will conquer Constantinople, our prophet prophesied that. But we will conquer Constantinople because the Ottoman Empire did things which were wrong, which have to be corrected. And so when the Muslim army conquers Constantinople after the Great War, we will return Hagia Sophia to those to whom it rightfully belongs, the Christian people. Minister was astonished when he heard that. And that would cement the alliance between this Ummah and that Ummah. What has been happening since I went to Russia and I went to the Balkans to explain the Quran in the way that the Ottoman Empire never did for 600 years. And you say they were the great champions of Islam. That's what you say. But everywhere that the Ottoman Empire went, they left a legacy of bitterness and hatred for Islam. That's what the Ottoman Empire did. And when I went and I told them what is in the Quran, increasingly, those Christians are now accepting the Quran to be the word of the one God and praise is due to Allah. So after a Muslim army conquers Jerusalem and Jerusalem is liberated and the bogus state of Israel goes back into the garbage bin from where it came out in the first place. The holy state of Israel will replace it. The state established by Nabi Dawood, David, Nabi Suleiman, Solomon, that holy state. And Jesus will rule the world from Jerusalem. And who will he have with him? We have this brainwashed Ummah of Muhammad which says that the only way a Christian could enter heaven <laughs> is if he takes the Shahada and becomes a follower of Muhammad. There is no other way. That is the brainwashing that is taking place in this Ummah. But the Quran doesn't say that. A Christian can believe that the Quran is the word of God and yet remain a follower of Jesus. And there was such a Christian who was a king. And when Ja'far radiallahu ta'ala who recited from Surah to Maryam for that Christian king, the Negus of Abyssinia, these were his words. He said, this Quran has come from the same source as the gospel. So he accepted the Quran as the word of God. When he died, the angel Gabriel came to inform the prophet that the king had died. And the prophet then said to his companion, let us perform the 
Salatul Janaza, or funeral prayer for him. This is what the companions of the Prophet said. How can we pray for someone قَدْ مَاتَ عَلَى الْكُفْرِ How can we pray for someone who died with kufr? Meaning, he was worshipping Jesus as God. And he believed in the Trinity. So the companions of the Prophet ask, how can we pray for someone who died with this kufr? And then Allah sent down revelation in the Quran on this occasion. And in that revelation, Allah said, بَعَدَوْزَ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ وَمِنْ أَهْدِ الْكِتَابِ لَمَنْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْكُمْ وَمَا أُنْزِلَ إِلَيْهِمْ إِلَىٰ أَخِرِ الْآيَةِ And amongst the Ahadul Kitab, and he's speaking mostly about Christians, not so much about Jews. Amongst the Christians, there are those who will believe that this Qur'an is the Word of God and also believe in what came down to them. But still, they remain Ahadul Kitab. They don't become a member of this Ummah. So this brainwashed Ummah needs to go to a laundry and get their brains washed over again. So in this situation, when the Muslim army liberates Jerusalem, it is a Khilafah state which will be established in Jerusalem, headed by the Messiah. And his followers will rule the world with him. And I am not a follower of Jesus. No, I don't know about you. I'm a follower of Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him. But it is the Messiah and those who follow him who will rule the world from Jerusalem. And our Imam, Imam al-Mahdi, and we who follow him, we will have another Khilafah state in Mecca. And this Khilafah state will support the Messiah. Any more questions? Question about riba. Question on 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 is that still be back, number one? Number two. Wait, wait, one question at a time. <laughs> no, I mean, the same question. Can the solution be uh, that this person is saying, what don't you follow the Quran? Because Or MP, and then return to me with Okay. When uh, you want to deal with the subject of inflation, not at the macro level, at the micro level, and when you are lending money, or you're borrowing money. The transaction must be denominated in dinar and dirham. So if the loan is for 
a hundred thousand ringgits. The tra the contract will say that you I am lending you so much so many ounces of gold. So when you have to repay me, you will pay me the ringgit's value of so much in gold. In this way, the extra ringgit's that you are paying to me would not be rebuffed because the, the transaction is denominated in dinar and dirham. Next question. Mean that by then the whole world will be fully in In English, okay, no problem. Just slow. Does it take for the US dollar to boleh boleh refresh soalan kurang jelas. Kurang jelas. Ah. Kurang jelas. Yes. yes. Soalan saya adalah apakah the US dollar bank collapse the ten years as all the things as such a thing will that event allow the whole world to embrace China and China? If the US dollar collapse, will the world embrace China and China? Oh no no no. Is that your question? The Quran has two kinds of verses. Ayat muhkamat, verses which are plain and clear. And ayat muhkamat, mutashabihat, with verses which have to be interpreted. And the reason why Allah has put ayat mutashabihat is that Washington should get free here. <laughs> They can't understand the Quran. There is such an ayah mutashabiyah in the Quran where Allah says, "In taliku ila zillin zi sada si shrub, proceed to a shadow which is comprised of three parts." When you interpret in the Quran, you must say Allah knows best because only Allah can confirm that an interpretation is correct. But if your interpretation is correct, it becomes the truth, and it will survive. And if not, it will be followed, it will go down the river of no return. I have interpreted this to be Dajjal, who will first come as a shadow. And the three parts of the shadow must take place, and only then the shadow will disappear after the conquest of Constantinople, and the Jai will appear in person. Now then, my book, Jerusalem in the Quran, is a debacle. I wrote it more than 20 years ago. And I show the passage from Pax Britannica to Pax Americana to what I anticipated to be Pax Judaica. And that this passage involved not only military transition from the one to two to three, but more importantly, monetary transition from the British sterling pound to the US dollar to what will come in the future which is entirely electronic money. Electronic money. I was in Putrajaya, it was it yesterday. My Malaysian driver's license expired three years ago. And now they, in order for me to get my Malaysian driver's license renewed, I have to do a driving test. But I've been driving for 55 years now. So I have to show that I can reverse a car. I can drive uphill and I can drive in the city roads. 
So we went to Putrajaya. We got the provisional driver's license, and uh, in about two weeks' time, I'll get a test. So we were hungry, and we stopped in a food court to have something to eat. And every single customer who came to buy, I saw something strange. No one took out any money, none. Everybody had something called a, a smartphone. And they would do something with the smartphone and show the shopkeeper. And the shopkeeper said, fine, they go. They were paying for the food with an electronic transaction. I say, my gosh, Malaysia, this is progress. <laughs> Yes, the child is embracing you. <laughs> and you are you are so innocent of the fact this is progress. Where all transactions will now be electronic transactions. And then you will have the rope firmly placed around your neck and you deserve it. Yeah. One more question? There, there, this brother. Brother nearby. The question is, if the petrodollar monetary system is coming to an end, as the US dollar is riding out into the sunset, does this mean that gold dinar and silver dirham would replace it? I just answered that question. And I said, after Pax Britannica, came Pax Americana. And after Pax Americana, my view is that Pax Judaica will come. One central bank for the whole world. One monetary system for all of mankind. So bye-bye to, to the Malaysian ringgit. Salamat uh, data. Bye bye. Salamat huh? Salamat, yeah, whatever it is. <laughs> to the Malaysian ringgit. Your Prime Minister probably doesn't know that. And uh, all of mankind will be trapped into electronic money. The gold dinar is long, still with to come. But Israel already has gold dinar and silver dirham as legal tender. Um, Zimbabwe is a major producer of gold. And the government of Zimbabwe has minted gold coins and put them in the market. And they have the capacity to be used as money. The government of Zimbabwe was defying the IMF. And the IMF chosen, chose to turn the blind eye to Zimbabwe rather than to have the whole apple cart turned over upside down. Many states in the United States of America now have laws in which Gold and silver coins are rec recognized as legal tender. Malak's Iran, excuse me, the Islamic Republic of Iran, 
ask the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, <laughs> ask Egypt with Al Azhar University, <laughs> ask Malaysia with your kings and your prime ministers. Is there any, world, any place in the world of Islam today which recognizes dinar and dirham as legal tender? None. That is why I ended this lecture, which is an important lecture today. That our struggle has to be to get Pakistan to defy the Yankee puppy dogs who are military generals in the armed forces and get Pakistan to recognize Dinar and Dirham as legal tender, as the first stage of the effort to extricate ourselves from the slavery of electronic money. One more question, last. Okay. Okay, one. This one, please, skip. Okay. So, my question, I would like to ask, is there such thing as Dongu Rock Law in to have international riba in the corner? Any darura pertaining uh, riba transaction? Darura is the law of necessity. And the Quran recognizes the law of necessity. That if there is no food available, and the only food is lahmul khinzir or pork, then in order to survive, you are allowed to eat the pork until such time as you can get food. When I lived in the United States, I found scholars of Islam declaring that the law of Darura applies so you can borrow money and interest to buy a house, only the first house, only the first house, not a second, because of the law of Darura. <laughs> so I said to myself, but you can make hijrah. You can leave the United States and go to Kotabaru. Instead, you remain in the United States. And guess what? La hawla wa la quwata. You eating the pork and licking your fingers? You enjoying the pork? And you are so happy by the house you bought? And you're showing off to people, I got this, this is the American dream. So you're eating the pork and you are licking your fingers. Number two, you should be eating the minimum amount of pork, but you fill your pit. Look at the big mansion. <laughs> huh? Number three, you will eat the pork only while you do not have food. And while you're eating the pork, you're searching, where can I get food? But these fellas sign a contract for 30 years of pork. Yes, there is Darura in Islam. But this is not Darura. This is a betrayal of the Quran. Okay, I think we had enough questions. Yeah. One more, last. What is the question? Brother, can, can you rephrase again your question? Jesus is minting the graven image on the gold coin during his time? Yeah, they are, they are 
transaction they are they doing was interest transaction. That's that's why it differs uh, for MD and term that is over. Right? So what? Uh, why? Like the transaction is equal to equal only, right? They are just uh, they are just ex exchanging the graven image coin to the normal coin. His brother asking about uh, during Jesus' time, he's uh, minting the, uh, yeah. the the money, changing the graven image to the yes. non non no image. What was happening in the temple, which was Masjid Al Aqsa, was that people would come to the temple of Masjid Al Aqsa with the Roman coin and would exchange it for temple money which had no graven image. But if this was one ounce of Roman money, then the exchange had to be one ounce of temple money. But the money changers were not doing that. They were giving an unequal exchange of gold for gold. And they were pocketing the difference between the two. And that was what Nabi Isa Islam condemned because it was riba. So if they were exchanging gold for gold at equal weight and equal uh, purity, equal purity and equal weight, then there would be no haram, no riba. Okay, we've had enough and uh, if you want to bring your books to me, I will autograph them for you, inshallah. <laughs>